Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday, fresh off your week at a conference. You feeling refreshed yes. or tired? Uh, everything, all the above. I'm like, you ever get you? I think you get it. Like you go to VRMA, right? And you get excited. You get to see everybody in person. You come home and you just have so much you got to do right afterwards. Yeah, that's where I'm at. So, but this was great. Our first podcast <laughs> movement conference. Uh, so it's all about podcasting, which um, I think I geeked out a little bit more than I expected for myself because I don't have anyone to geek out with at home. So I just kind of took it out on everybody at the conference, which was great. But it was phenomenal. I had a great time. Good. Well, yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Yeah, new uh, microphone the, and everything. I know. New mic. You know, had to had to do it. You're we're playing with all the best tools, toys, and software is out there so it was like getting to see some of our current like software partners that we use and then uh you know all of our microphone partners was great got to meet the team in person and when i say the team shout out to claire uh who's head of production and content with amplified um uh, it was super cool just like you know great to be in person um met up with a lot of our short-term rental folks so noble crawford mike artis and we had steven suarez from other podcasts on the network julie george it was just, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal time. So nice. Yeah. Sorry. I could probably just talk the whole episode yeah. about the last week, but I zoned out there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell. I could tell. Uh, well, how's your week? How I, you know, we didn't get to do our, our frequent calls and all that other stuff. So how was it's it? Good, man. We're, uh, we're getting closer and closer to going live with storied. It's a lot of work for all you entrepreneurs out there. Um, yeah. you understand the, the whole push before go live is, is real. So that's the, the stage we're in here for the next month or so, but everything's shaping up and, uh, can't wait. I love it. Well, uh, we have a lot to, t- uh, to jump into and to cover today, but before we do it, I told you I was going to do this, uh, earlier, but I'm going to plug a couple things, uh, a couple quick learnings that I took away from the conference. Um, we love getting messages from listeners. We actually get quite a few from Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, so I wanted to give Oscar a quick shout out from Mexico, your home. He is an Airbnb short-term rental host out in Mexico. Does a great job, but he is always engaging with our content. So I wanted to give him a quick shout out. And then also, shameless plug to uh, this new texting platform. It's not like a spam text platform. We're not going to send you a bunch of stupid updates all the time it's only going to work for when we're live on the show but if you have questions comments or thoughts you could text us at the number on the screen if you're listening to the audio version then definitely check out the show notes so you could text in your questions for next week but we're going to feature questions and listeners throughout all of our episodes and we want to make it more direct so this is not my personal number but it's also not a spammy number just an fyi so i wanted to put that out there 720-807-3367. 720-807-3367. Amen, baby. And then you can also go to gmhlive.com and you can watch us there too. So anyways, enough of the shameless plugs. Michael, what is the first topic at hand today? Because a lot's happened last week. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a bunch of news. So let's hit a couple headlines and then we'll jump more into the topic, which is hotels resurgence. Um mm-hmm. We've talked a lot about short-term rentals resurgence on this show, but the numbers are starting to shape up for hotels in a, a good way. So we'll dive into that in the second half of the show. Um, to get things started, we've got a few headlines of the week. Where do you want to start, Will? I would say the interesting one for me, because I was in a marketing session at the conference, got an email notification from Rental Scale Up, and, you know, Congratulations to Tebow and the team, but uh, I was kind of shocked, surprised. Price Labs purchases slash acquires, whatever you want to call it, uh, rental scale up, which is very unique. Um, not a play I would expect a dynamic pricing software uh, company to to go, but very smart. Media is a is a great it's a great tool for for growth, but yeah, it was that was the headline that caught my attention this week for sure. Yeah, I love I love the move. Uh, Tebow does probably the best analysis of the mm-hmm. short-term rental space out there. 
and Price Labs has a bunch of data. So it makes, makes sense, sense for Price Labs to help amplify their audio a little bit through, uh, through what Tebow's built. And I don't know the demographics of, uh, of Price Labs, where they're strong, if it's mostly North America. It could mm -hmm. be a play to help increase their brand awareness in Europe, where rental scale up has a, a pretty good foothold. Um, I don't know, you know, the details behind it. This, this was news to me, yeah. but I like the, I like the move, you know, when you're looking to acquire companies, you want to either acquire your competitors and gain market share or mm -hmm. make moves that are, are going to help you grow your business, uh, ultimately grow your market share. And I do think depending on what they paid for it, this one makes sense. Um, and you know, Tebow's. I'm a huge fan of him. So congrats, buddy. Yeah, I was going to say, really, really good play. Loved it. I think from a media buy standpoint, now they have a consistent outlet, whether, you know, on top of, you know, shorttermrentals.com and all these other platforms that they could be in. Now they have a dedicated audience that they could always hit and always be in front of. Um, I, I think it really just goes into a smart play of omnipresence. So, whether people need dynamic pricing software or not, they're going to see Price Lab's name. And if they ever do decide to go that route, they're going to see it. So really smart play. Um, more news. Uh, so Landing raises Series C funding uh, just last week. A little, I think a little bit over $30 million, if I'm not mistaken. But... It was 100 It was a lot. Oh, well, okay. My bad. Um, <laughs> this one's not... It's, I guess it could be classified hospitality. It's not short terminal. It's not hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, the future of housing, it might be a stretch, but it's an interesting concept where you can lease any furnished apartment and move around to any of their buildings uh, with a two week notice. So it's, it's okay if they only have four or five locations, but I, I believe I read they opened 33 different markets last year. And when you have that kind of depth and you can move from Cincinnati to Tampa, to New York, to LA, to Toronto, that becomes pretty cool, especially if you're a business owner who needs to be traveling and spend some extended amount of time in certain spots. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be a traveling nurse, you could be a flight attendant, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I like this concept. I don't, I don't know how big that market is, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, we're willing and, to put in lots of money into it. Yeah. So, for correction on my on my side, it's 125 million Series C's funding, and like you just said, I don't know what the market is for this, but I have a feeling it's that I think a lot of that capital is probably going to go into helping create that market. I think there is a market, but there's no real provider right like everyone's just kind of doing airbnb or get on verbo or... name, name brands um yeah. and they have to get to that point i do think there can be a market that people that 100 don't want to buy furniture that do that do want to move around a lot yeah i mean it's it's kind of perfect for you it's just it's a it's a price point question for me too mm -hmm. um the, the groups of people that are traveling around like that aren't your people typically making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year and can pay four grand a month in rent. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure it scales based on the cities you select, but it has to be an attainable price point to attract the, the demographic that's going to be traveling, uh, basically digital nomading around. Yeah. Yeah, that and like you said, I think like if you look at the, I don't know, just the amount of entrepreneurs I got to meet this last week, but then also seeing involved in other like categories of like whether it's different industries or just short term rentals in general or hospitality, the younger demographic that is making high six figures, right? Like they're like you said, like me, I don't, I, my new apartment I'm moving to this month is not, it's not an empty unfurnished rental. It's fully furnished. Yeah, it makes it easier. It's cheaper to do it that way. You're making than half a million dollars a year. You, you're buying a house. You're not living in an yeah. apartment. 100%. Like, 100%. And 
maybe you can afford to have a subscription if, if that's what landing is doing uh, mm-hmm. and be able to stay in their places for extended periods of time. But you're more than likely owning a house, not, you know, moving around without furniture from for city sure. to city. So yeah. interesting concepts. I think it's, it's a trend that has to catch on. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think the the addressable market, if the price point's right, is going to be pretty interesting. Hundred um, percent. Another cool topic that we covered in our uh, group chat with Brandy. So shout out to Brandy. She'll be on again next week for anyone who's watching live and listening to the replay here. Um, Brandy, yeah, coming back first Monday of every month. But we were talking about the change in leadership with Vicasa. So very. I think there's a couple of really good points that was kind of made throughout this group chat. I think it's kind of interesting, right? Like they're getting traction in certain areas and then they replace the leadership. And now is it, you know, is it like one step forward, two steps back type of deal? Um, so I also like personally, I will say this on live recording. I don't know who this guy is. I actually never heard of him before. So you may have a really intense, good background that fits what Vicasa wants to do. But for me, it was just a new name and sounds you know, interesting that they're shifting leadership right at, you know, at this time. So, well, um, I mean, I think Matt's been around for two years. I never met him, so I can't, you know, say anything personally about him. Yeah. Um, from the article, he's going back into retirement. <laughs> um, I guess you take a billion dollar company public and you get to retire for a second time. Yeah. A life that I'm sure I will never understand or, <laughs> or uh, attain, but. Uh, congrats on your retirement, Matt. It, the life cycle of a, or lifespan of a CEO in a publicly traded company is not very long, typically, unless you're one of the founders. And mm. so it's seeing a change is not surprising. Seeing record numbers in you know, a quarter where travel is booming, anybody could do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist at the at the controls to manufacture travel in 2022 to sunny places. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think it's on the the new CEO to figure out how to make Vacasa profitable because they haven't had any profitable months ever, to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think change is change can be a really good thing. I don't see it as a bad sign um, that, that things are a mess or anything, but who knows? I'm not behind the veil, so it could be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much so. Just interesting for me to, I yeah, if they're doing, yeah, it, you're right. I'll just agree to everything you just said. So Move on. moving on. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And so another company, so I find it interesting. A couple of weeks ago, we were all like, oh man, funding is slowing down in the space. And now we're seeing all these funding um, uh, announcements. Skipper raises 5.8 million from Derive Ventures. So again, another uh, chunk of change coming into the industry again, which is always refreshing, which um, I know we've kind of made comments on the like economy side. You know, it's, it's, you know, I, yeah, I'll let you go. I can hear you. Yes. I can hear your thinking. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm actually pulling up a chart that I shared with my co-founders on the dry powder that's sitting in venture capital funds right now. Mm. And, and I wish I'd shared this with you before so we could could uh, show it, but yeah, yeah. The amount of dry powder that VC firms have had in general, the rolling average over the past 20 years is about 100 million dollars. Or sorry, mm. 100 billion dollars uh in in cash ready to be deployed right now there is 500 billion dollars a half a trillion dollars sitting in venture capital's bank accounts waiting to be deployed so they're waiting for the market to drop or the market to bottom out in order to get the best valuation to make the most returns for their investors makes sense so when there comes a, a company that's got good growth trajectory, solving a real problem, uh, is on good financial stability, investments will be made and big investments can be made as well. 
because there's tons and tons of capital out there. Uh, a lot of people have pulled their markets from the pulled their cash from the public markets for obvious reasons. And you know, venture capital funds sitting on half a trillion dollars uh, shows you what what you need to see. Mm-hmm. Um, again, if your business is growing, if you've got profitability or a clear path to profitability, you can get funding. Uh, but if you've been a company that's focused purely on growth and not at all on the bottom line for the past five years when money was super easy to get, it's going to get a lot harder. Uh, there, these, these VC, VC shops are value shopping. Uh, and it, they will deploy capital. There's plenty of it. It's just look, you got to look good. No more lipstick well, on a pig. Well, you got to be, or you can be uh, the previous founder of WeWork and get 350 million for an idea. <laughs> sounds like, so yeah, it's uh, I get it. People are upset about that one, but yeah. he did build a billion dollar business and there's only so many founders that have ever built a billion dollar business. So yes, it skyrocketed valuations got out of hand and it tanked again, but we were still a multi-billion dollar business. So, um, I don't know if we can give I, him all I wouldn't credit give him the money because of the scruples standpoint, yeah. the, yeah. the lack of moral standing or, or being in touch with reality. But I see why an investor would back him. You know, if you've, if you've built $1 billion company, you can do it again, especially with the right resources. Hmm. Um, all right. So main topic is hotel recovery, which I know, you know, we've talked about in the past, obviously, but I don't know for, what do you think? Is it sooner than you expected for them to start coming up with, you know, we're seeing a little bit more activity, whether it's funding, whether it's acquisitions, you know, we saw SiteMinder, um, you know, obviously they're a tech platform, but, um, you know, acquired another guest experience platform and yeah. all sorts of stuff. So I'm just kind of curious. Do you think it's sooner than you expected to see more activity? Yes and no. Um, the groups that focus heavily on leisure are going to recover faster or at least look like they're recovering faster. The groups that are heavy business travel or group travel uh, are still lagging a little bit. So there, there's some indicators you can look at forward looking. Um, a quarter of Hyatt's all-inclusive business is already booked out for the first few months of 2023 mm-hmm. in a period where booking windows have been really small since the start of COVID. Uh, so that's a really good sign for leisure travel. People are still traveling. Prices are mm-hmm. going up. People don't care. They're, they're going to take their vacation. Uh, in July, STR reported that uh, it was a record high room rates for the month of July uh, in history. So there's never been higher prices in the hotel world than there were in July of 2022. Well done, hotels. As a consumer, that hurts, Uh, (laughs) but we're all dealing with inflation. And I also read somewhere, so I can't cite it because I don't remember where I read it, but 53% of Americans traveled in July, which is mind-blowing. Yeah, I don't know how they calculate that number. Maybe some people took two vacations and it counted uh, as two, but half of America was on the move in July is obviously a record and a good sign for for hotels looking to recover and short-term rentals for that matter for sure i was curious how much do you think was you know european travel now that we had less restrictions with travel to europe less anywhere overseas basically um the the you know parity with the euro and american dollar so like is that do you think that's a driver was it all us like i want to know what was domestic and what was foreign um, I can speculate that American travel to Europe still isn't to 2019 levels, mm-hmm. but it, the international travel is recovering faster because of the rate parity between the dollar and the euro and the pound. Uh, 
Uh, it's a great time as an American to travel to Europe. Um, <laughs> when I studied abroad in Germany, I think it was a 1.4 to 1 uh, euro, which is high. But now uh, it's basically at parity, 1 to 1. So you're getting things 40% less. Even with European inflation at like 15%, it's still a discount. So um, it, we'll see. I, I think the if the dollar can remain strong, I think we'll see that trend continue more and more as mm -hmm. people come back with experiences and say, hey, I just stayed at a five-star hotel for $300. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to to spread the word with positive experiences helps. Now, all of this good news with hotels, there's still a lot of like cloudy skies ahead of us. Yeah. Leisure travel is booming. Business travel is still lagging. We are not at the business travel levels that we were pre-COVID. And it might take us a few more years to get to that point because so many people understood or understand now that you can get some work done remotely. I think a lot of people also understand you have to get some work done in person. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about the global economy. Obviously, people are not going to be spending as much as they were even last year because uh, companies are trying to conserve cash a little bit and make sure they're solvent for the next you know, 24 months while this thing goes away. And then there's even more challenging forecasts that the finance teams that these companies have to do, which is forecasting for inflation. Mm -hmm. How you do that uh, blows my mind. I'm sure there's <laughs> yeah. some people that are smart enough that can do it. But for companies, for mega companies that have exposure in various parts of the world, not only are they calculating Forex exchanges, but they're also calculating uh, inflation rates at different levels. The U.S. inflation rate is high, but it's not as high as Europe. And inflation's going up. The euro is going down. It, it's already boggling my mind how how to put all of those pieces together and, and put a logical forecast in front of uh, Wall Street. So, um, not jealous of y'all's job finance teams of hotel yeah. major hotel companies, but, um, you know, somebody's got to have, to, somebody's going to figure it out. hundred percent. And again, for me as a previous hotel operator, I'm curious to know, and I wish like there was a data report. So maybe we'll hit up Jamie from uh, air DNA and see if they can pull something together, which I doubt they could on the guest experience side. But, uh, I would love to know with this, like with the increase in rate, with the increase in travel, with all this stuff, plus a little bit of gloom just hanging over the, the side, what is the guest satisfaction rate or level at for this type of travel? Because if the rates are this high and people are booking it, I get it. There's part of that mindset that really just shifts and people are like, look, I don't care. I just want to get out of my, my home, my city, my state, whatever. Um, but there's got to be like a fine line of like when that guest experience doesn't meet expectation for the dollar or the price, you know, the, uh, the price one that people are paying at, um, you know, unless all these hotels and short term rental companies are just getting fully staffed and somehow are recovering on the labor side. I doubt that all these expectations are being met for the dollar price that they're paying. Um, so that's always going to be, I think something I'm going to hang on to until we start to see more, more of a less, less labor concerns. That's my, that's my biggest issue that I have with yeah, all these rates. Yeah, you pay more, you expect to get more. And oftentimes you're paying more and getting even less now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know how much further hotel revenue managers can push rates and consumers still purchase yeah. rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll see a compression on price a little bit, which makes sense, but yeah. you're right. The satisfaction levels of customers of, of guests, um, 
is, is probably not what it used to be. 100%. It's, it's got to, it's, yeah, I'd be shocked uh, if it was at a high level. Um, but I can say from a business standpoint, you know, this last week I was traveling for business. Everyone at that hotel it was 1,800 rooms uh, in Dallas. A lot of those rooms were sold for this conference on a business uh, side. So that looked really positive. And I don't think a lot of outside of airline issues, we had a lot of delays due to weather. And I have a crazy story to tell you about it, but like it was a whole weird thing on like, I fall asleep on my flight because I get, I woke up at like 1 a.m. to go to do this early flight. And I wake up thinking it was a direct flight to, to Dallas, which it was. Wake up in Oklahoma City. And the pilot's like, welcome to Oklahoma City. We uh, needed to fuel up and it's raining in Dallas. So like that's a two and a half hour flight and you have enough fuel. So I woke up all confused and a little frustrated, but um, didn't get was supposed to land at like 930. Didn't get to my hotel until about three or four p.m., which was great. Loved it. Had a great time on the plane. But outside of that, the hotel was phenomenal. Like no issues with the room, no issues with check in. And that was the overall consensus with everybody attending this conference so that was at least a uh, a good sign for maybe it was just because it's a big a big um, property with a lot of travel already there but it was uh it was refreshing not to have any issues on site and rather just on the way there from the plane but yeah yeah. only you would fall asleep and wake up in a different city sure it's not the only time it's happened no but i still like I was confused. Like you didn't have enough fuel for a two and a half hour flight. That was weird. That that threw me off. Um, we yeah. probably didn't have enough fuel to circle long enough to land. When yeah, that's what, they, that's what they say. That's okay. what they say. Um, um, one last piece before we wrap up. So in terms of recovery, the seven biggest hotel brands certainly tried to shore up capital and, and reserve cash during the pandemic. And they did. Um, they're sitting, the top seven brands are sitting on over $7 billion in cash. Uh, so how they decide to spend it, some will use, some will dividend shareholders, some will go shopping and purchase other brands or properties maybe, probably not. Uh, but I think... Yeah, you know, that's that's a sign that the hotels are on stable grounds now. Uh, when you're sitting on the equivalent of a billion dollars cash each, you're you're in a good spot. So, all in all, hotel recovery seems to be here. Everyone seems to be on more firm ground. Mm-hmm. Um, probably unless you are a hundred percent business travel hotel. <laughs> yeah. Well, like uh, I think, like we said last week too, I think there's going to be a lot of people shopping and coming out with uh, some "look at what I bought" announcements this coming few months. So that In will be January. We said M and A is going to be the theme of 2022, and yep, it's certainly been the case. And and I think it'll only ramp up between now and the end of the year. Hundred percent, couldn't agree more. Well. Good episode. We are hitting that 30 minute mark. And uh, as I told Michael before we went live on this one, I'm going to plug the texting number one more time. I'm going to plug gmhlive.com if you ever want to go watch live directly and get notifications when we're going live prior to social media. You can always do that. But uh, shout out again to our amazing listeners that engage with us off the recording, off the podcast side. We love getting your comments and everything like that from uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. So I appreciate everyone who tunes in. And Michael, anything from you? See you next week. (laughs) Perfect. See you all again next week.